Today we are going to talk about the mass number, atomic number, and atomic symbol, and these are found on the periodic table, and each of these gives us information about the particular element and is very useful in describing their characteristics, um, how they are going to react with other compounds or with other elements in compounds, um, and then we're also going to look at uh, the types of compounds that we can make with the elements on the periodic table. So today we're going to just look at how the table is arranged and then what the mass number symbol and atomic number of an element are. So to start off with the atomic number, this is the number of protons and electrons. And if you're looking at a box on the periodic table, you have the symbol in the middle, you have the mass down here, and this is the number with a decimal. Um, and then up here is a whole number, and that is the atomic number. And this number tells us the number of protons and electrons. So carbon has the number 6, and that means it has 6 protons and 6 electrons. Calcium has the number 20, and it has 20 protons and 20 electrons. So let's fill out this table. Um, element K is potassium, and it has an atomic number of 19, so there are 19 protons and 19 electrons. If we look, if the element has 5 electrons, that would mean it has 5 protons, and the atomic number is 5. Looking on your periodic table, that would be boron, or B. S is sulfur. It has an atomic number of 16. That means it has 16 protons and 16 electrons. For V, if it has 23 protons, its atomic number must be 23, and then it would have 23 electrons. So the atomic number gives us the number of protons and the number of electrons. Next we come up to is the mass number, and the mass number must be given. It's not found on the periodic table. And this is the number of neutrons um, and protons added together. Uh, so with this we can figure out the number of neutrons because we can subtract the mass number minus the atomic number and we can get the number of neutrons. Here is a couple ways to write the um, right elements. You can write the mass number on top, and then the atomic number, and then the symbol. If we do this, the number of neutrons um, would equal 12 minus 6. So carbon has six neutrons, because this mass number is the number of protons and neutrons. We can also write it with um, the element name and then the mass number. Since the atomic number is found easily on the periodic table, if I just give you the mass number, you should be able to figure out the number of neutrons. Look at the periodic table, you can find the num number of protons and electrons. So for example, um, silicon 28, uh, if we look on the periodic table, it is it has a symbol of um, SI, and the mass number would go up on top, it's 28, and then from the periodic table we know its atomic number is 14. If we do this, the number of neutrons equals 14, because that is the 28 minus 14. Now for hydrogen 1, we um, write that as 1 neutron, or 1 for the mass number. The atomic number is 1. So, um, the neutrons here 
equals 0 because 1 minus 1 would be 0. Okay, so looking at this one, this is gold, and we can see that the mass number is 197 and the atomic number is 79. The number of protons is 79. We just get that straight from here. The number of electrons is 79. Again, we get it from here. The number of neutrons we need to take 197 minus 79 and we come up with 118. So for the count of the pieces inside the an atom of gold, we have 79 protons, 79 electrons, and 118 neutrons. Okay, so let's look at counting the protons, electrons, and neutrons of each of these. So um, I'm just going to make little columns in here. So we have P, E, and N. So for beryllium, we have four protons, four electrons, and then for the neutrons, we're going to take 9 minus 4 equals 5. So we have 5 that goes there. Uh, for neon, we have 10 for protons, 10 for electrons, and then 20 oh, minus 10 equals 10. So we have 10 neutrons. For sodium, we have 11 protons, 11 electrons, and then 23 minus 11 equals 12. We have 12 neutrons for sodium. And these can vary the mass number. Not all electrons have the same mass number. Um, so not all sodium have a mass number of 23. They may have a few more or a few less of the neutrons, which would change their mass number. So maybe you could come across a bunch of sodium 23s that would have 12 neutrons, but then maybe you find a sodium 24 that has 13 neutrons. Or maybe you find a sodium that is 22 minus 11 would give us 11 neutrons. So um, the mass number can be changed. That's why we have to give it to you. So here, let's do the math here and figure out um, how many neutrons we have in these. So the first one, pretty easy. We have 16 minus 8. We get 8. For sulfur, 32 minus 16 is 16. For silver, we have quite a few neutrons in here. So 108 minus 47, we come up with 61 neutrons for silver. For bromine, we have 80 minus 35 gives us 45. So there are 45 neutrons in, bro in this particular bromine. And then for lead, we have 125 of the neutrons um, in this particular type of lead. Okay, looking at chemical bonding. So we already have identified the bits and the pieces and how to figure out bits and pieces inside an atom. Now how do those atoms interact? And there are four ways that atoms can interact. So a chemical bond are um, when atoms are held together by attractive forces. They can either share or transfer their electrons. Protons and neutrons do nothing when we look at um, bonding. So our four types, we have metallic, which deals with metals. We have ionic, which deals with charges, and then we have covalent polar and nonpolar, and these really are like the same type, but um, they have varying degrees of sharing their electrons, so we'll talk about each of those. Okay, first up is metallic, and this is where we have a crystal lattice of metal cations. Well, we know from 
our sticky tape lab that a cation is a positive ion and so the metals become these positive um, ions that are floating around and then we have these sea of electrons so the metals just kind of allow their electrons to flow wherever they want throughout the entire thing and then um, usually this deals with a single type of metal we'll do this occasionally we'll make an alloy where we may have um, a pattern of metals in here but for the most part we're dealing with one particular type of of um, metal so um, we call this the sea of electron model so atoms are arranged in a pattern electrons are shared freely so the electrons really just go wherever they want they swim all over this place in this lovely sea ionic bonding um, this is the one that we probably will work with the most because it has the most reactions. We can build this the easiest. So what is happening here? Our electrons are fully transferred between a metal and a nonmetal. So you have your metal and nonmetal, and like the metal's holding on to an electron. It's going to give it completely to the nonmetal. So you're left with a metal that's positive and a nonmetal that is negative, since this is a positive and this is a negative, they buddy up um, because of that positive negative liking to attract each other. So we have fully charged atoms because one has the electrons and the other does not. So when you write it, the symbol of two elements, a metal and a nonmetal, um, and this says the stair step, which we'll, we'll talk about in class, but it just is the barrier between the metals and the nonmetals on your periodic table. Um, we have what's called a cation, or the positive one. This one loses electrons. So the positive cation lost a negative electron. Then you have the anion, which is negatively charged because it has gained electrons. So it has more negative pieces. If we go back and listen to the, or talk about, um, you know, the chocolate chip cookie method, the cation would be ones that are chip light, and the negative ones, the anions, would be chip heavy. Okay, next up is covalent bonding. So on the covalent bonding, if we're looking at our stair step on our periodic table of the metals and nonmetals, the covalent bonding happens with all of these over here on the nonmetal side. And you need at least two of them. Um, and we divide them up into two groups. The first one being a polar group, meaning that one atom gets the electrons most of the time. And then we have a nonpolar where they share them evenly. So for the polar, you have an atom here and here. And the electron is going to swim over here and here and here and here. And then maybe go over here. And then it's going to come back and spend most of its time here. And then come over here and then go back. So the majority of the time that negative charge is hanging out over here. So we say this is, um, it kind of looks like a funky S, but it is sort of negative and sort of positive. They don't have a full charge, but they do have a slight charge. And water is one of those that does this. Now a nonpolar um, is when they share them evenly. So if we have our same two, or if we have our two, then the atom kind of does this back and forth, and maybe it'll do a double loop here, but then it'll come and do a double loop here, and back and forth, and back and forth. So we don't have any charges on either of the atoms. 
So here's a picture of what happens with the bonding. So um, when we're looking at the ionic bonding, we see that um, this one, which is slightly positive, and this one, which is slightly negative, they will attract to each other, okay? But there's nothing to stop another, a ne another negative from over here from it being attracted or, say, another positive here that's being attractive, and then we can just continue that on with another positive here that's attracted. So we're left with this kind of clump. This clump will um, just kind of all of these atoms will be grouped together because there's some positive or negative, some opposite charge that's pulling them together. When we put this one in water, in water, it breaks apart. When we look at the covalent bonding, we have an atom with some electrons and another atom that wants them, so they share. And this sharing is what causes the bond. Since the electrons are being shared between two atoms, those are stuck together. They really could care less about another one that's floating around in various areas. Okay, then we need to name these, and we will practice and practice and practice naming these. So when we're looking at naming the ionic compounds, the metal always goes first. So if we're talking about that stair step on our periodic table, we have the metals and the nonmetals. This side is going to go first every time. Um, <clears throat> when we're naming nonmetals, um, the nonmetal goes second, and then we're going to change the ending to IDE. And for example, um, oh, and for ionic, we ignore the little numbers. So we put the metal first, the nonmetal second, uh, change to the ending of the second, and then ignore the little numbers. So NABR, this is, used to be on the periodic table. If you look, it says bromine. We've taken off the I-N-E ending and put on I-D-E. So now we have sodium bromide. Then we have calcium oxide, which is really oxygen. Aluminum sulfide, instead of saying sulfur. And notice that we have this little 2 and this little 3. We said nothing about that in our answer. Because ionic compounds ignore little numbers. Okay. So when you are going from the formulas to the words, this is really easy because you just look at what pieces are involved. Magnesium, iodide. Potassium, nitride. Beryllium, chloride. You don't have to worry about these little numbers. The part that gets tricky is when you're looking at aluminum, sulfide, and you have to give the formula. Then you have to look into other things like charges and, and crossing out and making things balance, but we'll look at that more later. So what you need to know is how to go from the formula to the words. And with ionic, it's very simple. Metal name, like normal, non-metal second, with an IDE ending, and ignore those little numbers. For covalent compounds, this is where we get a little trickier because we need to, um, or we have what's called prefixes, and these prefixes are um, the, those little numbers. So we have 1 is mono, 2 di, 3 tri, 4 tetra, 5 penta, 6 hexa, 7 hepta, 8 octa, 9 nana, 10 deca. You will have to know these, this order and it'll just have to be memorized. So, 
memorize these. I won't give you this set of 10 on the period or on your quiz or test. Okay, to name them, the subscript or that little number appears um, after the element will tell you what the prefix is. So this 2 is going to be written when we write the name in front. So dinitrogen means this nitrogen has two of them. Tetra oxide is four, so we would have four oxygens. So these words form numbers and so you change the die to a two and put it at the end. Tetra is a four and you're going to put that in the end when you go to write your your formulas. So phosphorus trichloride. Now if you notice this is a one and we do have a prefix for one. We have mono. So we could say monophosphorus trichloride. Usually though when when they're in the front when it's the first one like this aluminum or iodine we don't write mono for the first one. I mean because really with the name there you assume there's at least one or we wouldn't have named it. So um, we see that more often when mono or there is one of the second elements listed and then we put the mono in place. So iodine, heptafluoride, aluminum oxide, magnesium sulfide, dihydrogen monoxide, and then sodium phosphide. So these are just some of your examples. Notice that we had the hepta, so we made seven. We had the um, di here, so we made the two.